Hello and welcome to another episode of the Indoor Environment Show. I'm Bob Krell. I'm founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Media. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Don Weeks, coming to us live from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, he is the president of the Indoor Environmental Quality Global Alliance, IEQGA. Hey, Don. Good morning. How are you today? Hey, good. You know, it, it just seems like it was a week ago when we were together in person. Uh, just it was a week yes, ago. Yes, well, we it was exactly a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we were so we were those of you uh, who saw some of the live broadcasts we streamed last week. We were uh, live at um, AIHCE twenty three in Phoenix, Arizona. That was fun. So we got to do some interviews. For yeah, it was a good time. There. Yeah, it was a good time. So, I understand you interviewed like eighteen different uh, people there. So it's quite a quite an accomplishment. Yeah, there was. There was, there, yeah, that we did a lot of shows for healthier workplaces for the AIHA program. So, in addition to the indoor environment show, so yeah, it was, it was a busy three days. I'm not gonna lie. So, anyway, well, today's show, super good interesting, show. talking yes. about air cleaners, and we have, we have, we have uh, a guest who is a return, like you mentioned in the pre-show, first returning guest on this program. He was on our first episode of this program in 2021. <laughs> Time flies. Yeah, it's almost two years. It's amazing. Yeah. So let me do the introduction. It's a, He is Associate Professor Paul Wacky, who has graduated from the Warsaw University of Technology in 1990. He received his PhD from the Technical University of Denmark in 1998, where he has been teaching and performing re research ever since. He has over 25 years of experience in research on human requirements in, in indoor environments. He's best known for his seminal work demonstrating that poor indoor environmental quality affects office work and learning performance. Other work influence uh, the requirements for ventilation uh, and air cleaning. Recent research includes uh, studies of emissions from humans, sleep qu uh, quality, performance of green buildings, gas phase air cleaning, and air quality in aircraft. So welcome, pal. Uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to all that uh, listen to us. And thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to be back. Yeah, we're happy to have you back too. I just want to mention that this particular uh, appearance is, is sponsored by AW, I'm sorry, AW, AICVC, AIVC. Uh, sorry uh, to everybody, AIVC. Uh, thank you, uh, Pal, for being here. And today's focus is going to be on air cleaning. But let me uh, let me ask you a few questions first to, to kind of set the mood for what we're going to be talking about. You, you had earned your master's, as I mentioned, from uh, Warsaw University of Technology in Poland and a Ph.D. in from the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, can you tell us uh, what was the focus of those degrees? Well, surprisingly, my interest at that time was in heating. and. Uh, uh, I made my master degree in heating of the uh, multi uh, residential uh, multi dwelling uh, house <clears throat> uh, multi residential house in Poland at that time uh, we came up with an idea I, I had a partner and we were doing together the job uh, on writing the thesis it was to retrofit the building propose new heating system and also reuse the uh, heat that was generated in those uh, homes on those dwellings hmm. at that time we didn't speak much about you know regeneration and uh, reducing the co2 signature and emission and uh, but uh, we thought that it could be an interesting uh, uh, idea to reuse the um, heat that was uh, exhausted in the um, ventilation system and use that heat to uh, for preparing the hot, uh, domestic hot water and <clears throat> for that purpose we used the heat pump and it was the time where uh, in the high-rise uh, multi-residential buildings in poland uh, uh, there was a requirement in the standard for the uh, mechanical exhaust uh, that were houses that had a 10 story and above 
so not for all of them but some of them <clears throat> so we were thinking that uh, maybe that would be an option and we could uh, neatly show that that was a, a actually um, a very effective solution later on i learned that in denmark a similar solution was used in the early 2000 i think they didn't use a heat pump but they used a, a heat exchanger to actually prepare uh, domestic hot water uh, from the exhaust. Today we use uh, basically the uh, uh, what's your called the uh, the balance system where you have a supply and an exhaust, uh, <clears throat> so the heat is uh, recovered on the um, heat exchanger. So basically, all the heat that is exhausted uh, and the exhausted air is basically recovered and then brought back to the supplier. <clears throat> So you did one of the early works on that, and now 30 years later, it's uh, it seems it's starting to be used commercially, and uh, and that's great. I guess it's good to see something you do when you're you're in in university to to see it all the way through to the present day. Yeah. But that that was my only connection with indoor air, or maybe with ventilation, and then I came to Denmark, and that has completely changed my life, and then I got interested in indoor air and indoor air problems so um, i completely changed my interest from the heating solutions to the ventilation solutions that's when uh, i was looking at uh in 1996 you, you wrote a document on sick building syndrome in your office environment measurements and evaluation for the nordic institute of advanced training in occupational health can you tell us uh, more about the findings in this uh, paper well i mean <laughs> At that time, sick building syndrome was a very popular term uh, in a sense that uh, uh, we characterize the uh, buildings and how they perform. So the main key performance indicator was the prevalence of sick building uh, syndrome. The term that was coined probably in the 80s um, that uh, described the uh, unusual uh, um, occurrence of the symptoms among the building occupants that could not be explained by any of the condition in a building, so but but by the general, you know, all the conditions in the buildings. <clears throat> and those symptoms were related to uh, respiratory symptoms, uh, dermal symptoms, and the um, more general symptoms like, such as headaches and uh, difficulty to concentrate, uh, um, overall fatigue, and so on. So on. <clears throat> At that time, I characterized the, uh, uh, the studies that uh, basically uh, brought and measured, used this method, and maybe characterize uh, how it should be used, uh, in, uh, uh, how, how it should be measured. Uh, it's not that simple to characterize a building using a, uh, by deploying the survey among the occupants and basically asking them about the symptoms because there are several aspects related to how you ask for the symptoms. Uh, other symptoms should be re recurring, uh, so often occurring, how, what is the recall time and what is the prevalence level. So there have been many different ways at that time to characterize buildings that develop certain index, uh, indices. Today, no, no. Uh, it's still used, but it's probably not used as sick building syndrome. It's maybe building related illnesses or building related mm -hmm. symptoms. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it, many people have changed to that. Uh, so you were at the uh, at uh, Denmark when you wrote this paper in 1996. You were, at the, you were at the Technical University going for your PhD. Yes, exactly. It was one, probably one of my topics of, because during a PhD, you need to take several exams, and that was one of the exams preparing me for the final dissertation. On and your final building. dissertation, your final dissertation was on the sick building syndrome, or something? no, 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 it was on. I, I actually, my dissertation was on three, three topics. One topic was on the uh, addition of pollution sources to determine ventilation uh, requirements in buildings. So it is the question that is now addressed in 62.1, for example, when you have a rate for building and people, and those rates were, uh, you add them. And I was studying that at this uh, during my PhD. Then the other topic was to better understand how we can perform sensory assessments 
So I was looking at the different um, uh, exposure response relationships in uh, and how people respond to different types of pollutants, trying to define sort of a standard atmosphere that you could be exposing people to better, um, how, to, how to say, uh, uh, in order to be better prepare people for sensory assessments and have more repeatable uh, um, results and then reduce the variance. And then finally, uh, I published the first work on the cognitive performance and uh, air quality where I showed that uh, changing uh, air quality in, a, in an office environment, uh, it was a simulated office environment, may have an effect on uh, how we work. And then that was continued and resulted in many publications uh, that actually sh showed that uh, improved ventilation or reduced pollution load in buildings uh, will have positive effect on um, work performance yeah that's that i i know is your your as i said in the introduction your seminal work and you've been working on that uh, 25 30 years now uh do you see uh more acceptance of that particular theory and more use of that theory now in buildings and and in and in work environments i see a lot of interest in it uh, i can speak for europe and the reason probably is, I mean, I saw the peak in the middle of between 2000 and 2010. There was a lot of interest, but then it somehow reduced and then now it's coming back. Um, and one of the reason is that when you renovate the buildings or energy retrofit buildings, uh, the benefits that you see are maybe um, are very small or it costs a lot uh, or the payback times are actually quite long so that there is an interest uh, in um, a to make sure that uh, during an energy retrofit you are not aggravating the conditions for people and b for additional non-energy benefits um, um, when you retrofit the building so um and of course the uh, work performance or maybe learning of children in schools is is a metric that can be used for uh, characterizing those non-energy benefits, they have actually very short uh, payback time. So they are economically very in interesting. For uh, uh, This is why there, there is an increased interest. However, however, there is always however, and the problem is that until now we have not developed the productivity meter in a sense that we don't have a an instrument or a method, a tool that would allow us to measure in buildings um, work performance. Uh, we can measure that and we can demonstrate, but it, we don't have a, um, a, a tool that can be used in many different studies. That creates a problem in comparison and demonstration that uh, what you promise is achieved. In a sense, if you promise your investor that uh, you know by investing so much money you will have that effect on productivity, how you can document it afterwards? You will need to have a tool for that, and, and that's, that's challenging, right? I mean, that, that that's, that's a very, very it's a little more abstract, right? It's, it's right, yeah. So uh, I, th there are some ideas of how to develop such a tool, and uh, we try to involve Ashra also to get some support on that uh so maybe we will develop something but uh at until now it's so this is one challenge then the other you know the other challenge is the how you I interpret it from the economic uh, 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 point of view so uh, anyway there are some challenges yeah. we know that yeah. it helps but there are challenges to to implement it um uh I think metering it is the, mo the the crucial part. So we can do the. We know that with the energy, we can predict the uh, energy in the retrofitted uh, houses or buildings using modeling. Often, this modeling results would not match the actual. So there will be a gap, but at least we have some method of measuring it. Whereas in case of um, productivity we don't have that standard method and that is um, a, a major limitation 
issue. There's another limitation, uh, limitation here is that, uh, um, is that uh, we, we really don't know how the entire environment affects uh, productivity. We, we, we see for the specific parameters such as, you know, thermal or specific domains like thermal environment, air quality, light, and uh, noise, but when they are all together in the environment, because we are never ex experiencing only one of those, mm -hmm. so how they together affect uh, productivity. And we are starting a project now, which is called Music, which we will be looking at that uh, particular uh, aspect of the combined yeah. effects of different parameters on our productivity. And hopefully we will be able to develop some method for measuring productivity as well. I mean, that, that's I always been I the challenge, it. though, right? I mean, that that that's with all these studies, because there's right. uh, intrinsically, you know, there's a, there's a, an indoor uh, a productivity benefit, but that's to quantify it. Right. It, it's always so, it's always so what we challenge. think. Of, yeah. What we think about is a sort of a battery of tests or one test or two tests that can be verified against the actual performance. And once we have that, that this can be used as some sort of a method of approximation there are also other methods that are uh, considered uh, such as there are groups that look at eeg uh, just to observe the uh, brain signals and so on so on <clears throat> of course implementing eeg at this time on the mass base is very difficult is probably not possible at all uh, even though we advanced with the instrumentation for doing this but um, maybe through EEG, we could be able to develop uh, some tool. Um, so there is a lot of development there, but uh, at the moment, uh, we cannot propose anything that, you know, you just say, uh, do this or do measure this. Unless you have really an environment in which you monitor performance of your employees uh, continuously. This is why, for example, um, absence rate is uh, often used and also self-estimated performance is used to do that with the self-estimated performance i would really warn ma many of the users that may not it may not translate into actual performance directly that could be affected by many other factors hmm. so, well that's uh, thank you know. yeah you did you say Very that the new and yeah, it sounds like it. It sounds you said mentioned the, the new project. Uh, it, what did you That's, say that the, the title of it is is music? Music, music. It's and, a multi. Uh, if I remember, it's a multi-sensory network or something like that. So we have a, <clears throat> a partners from Europe. It's a Marie Curie program uh, for a PhD students, uh, mm -hmm. which we have a P ten PhD students in partners in Europe. Partners are from Germany, France, Cyprus, Italy, Denmark. <clears throat> and there are also observers participating in this, uh, advisors from Belgium uh, and two other countries I don't remember now. So the idea is to, <clears throat> the idea is to look at the uh, uh, aspect of energy and how we can adapt <clears throat> to the different conditions and also how different domains, which we call domains is the environments like thermal environments, uh, air quality, light and noise influence and how much we, what, what is the room for the adapt adaptability for us. So uh, in our group, we'll have two PhD students. One will be looking at the behavioral aspects. So how behavioral aspects can be modified so how our behavior can be modified by incentives and how the environmental conditions affect our behavior and then the other one uh, uh, phd student will be looking at how those different domains affect cognitive performance so how when you have thermal environment together with light or together with noise and together with air quality how it, uh, what is the optimal maybe level, or can they be combined somehow to predict our cognitive performance? And so this is what we will be looking at. Very exciting. Uh, we've been thinking about this project for years, actually, and to look at the combined uh, interacting uh, inter interaction of those parameters, combined effects. 
and now we have an option and it's a large project so we hopefully to will be able to advance uh, that particular field that uh, that needs advancement <laughs> that's great I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the uh the results of your your research, uh, hopefully in the years to come, at uh, conferences where we can meet up sure. and talk about the how we found yeah. out about this way way, way back we, here in uh, June of uh, 2023. Yeah, we just uh, finished nearly uh, recruitment of PhD students, so we'll have a very ten now nine. Will the ten is still uh, in the process of selection. Mm -hmm. uh, very uh, clever uh, young people, or maybe not young, but I mean clever people who will be advancing that part of science. So That's we are great. looking forward to see the results and collaborate. Yeah, no, it's really, I'm glad to hear about this. Really, it's a, it sounds like a really, as you say, exciting uh, exciting. project to come up. Yeah, so. So today we wanted to talk a little bit about something that you uh, talked about in uh, autumn of 2022 when you presented a, a keynote speech about air cleaning at the AIVC Rotterdam Conference. And the title of your presentation was what we know and what we should know about air cleaning. Can you provide us with an overview of what you discussed and what were the main points in the speech? Right. Uh, so air cleaning is still debated a lot and uh, if at times it is very popular at times it is less popular um, and um, it is back uh, on the agenda uh, because of COVID-19 uh, pandemic but also because of the energy issues so <clears throat> what I wanted to show is uh, uh, basically summarize what we know about the air cleaning uh, processes and then uh, what are the major uh, challenges uh, for the future. So we can characterize, of course, the air cleaning process. Um, and uh, this basically principles are very well described. <clears throat> However, there are several uh, unknown uh, elements and still debatable issues in relation to the performance of the air cleaners to name few would be you know the of course the um, long-term performance of the air cleaners um, lack of standardization of our cleaners um, i was if i focus only on gas phase air cleaners for example uh, uh, use of the standard atmospheres to test the performance of their cleaners and so on so this is just few uh, aspects that really need to uh, uh, be discussed. Also, we, we need to look at the energy impact of the air cleaners. So we take for granted that the, uh, they can provide uh, saving, but uh, we really need to document that saving in relation to their efficiency. So this is something that uh, requires further elaboration uh, also you know there are to be honest there are uh, very different opinions about the air cleaners there are people who prefer not to use them there are people who would like to use them and then there are people somewhere in between and the reason for that is that there are different types of air cleaners some some air cleaners perform well some air cleaners perform not not well and in some areas uh, in the world, you know, you, you don't have to use our cleaners. I'm, I'm thinking, talking about a gas phase air cleaners. It's because um, maybe the air quality, uh, outdoor air quality is good. And uh, you can um, recover the energy from um, exhausted air. So uh, the air cleaners are not the option there. But this is only a part of the... Uh, how to say um, a part of the world is uh, the, in the most countries in the world there is air cleaning is a necessity uh, not only air cleaning for gas phase but also for the particle air cleaning uh, in still in many areas in the world we have the outer ambient air quality that is uh, uh, in a dramatic situation I think recently we saw the report that was published a paper that was published that showed that uh, still, for example, in Europe, uh, 
average European is exposed uh, to uh, 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 to the pollutants uh, at the levels that are exceeding uh, the, uh, the recommendations by WHO. If I remember well, I don't want to now make a mistake, but it's only like one percent of the European population that uh, is living in the areas where there is no exceedance. So we are all the time uh, exposed to elevated levels of uh, uh, pollutants. The problem with that is that unlike light or visual environment that we can see, unlike the uh, acoustic environment and noises and sounds that we can hear, and unlike the thermal environment where we can feel whether we feel hot or cold or neutral, the air quality of pollutants, uh, we have difficult to sense them. It's difficult for us to say, I am now in the environment where the levels of particles is too high or too low. I can say it's warm or cold, it's bright or dark, but I cannot say whether particle levels are high or low. I cannot say whether NO2 levels are high or low. I cannot, I, unless I can smell them. So, and also I get very quickly fatigued. My sense of smell gets very quickly fatigued. So uh, we are not very good in detecting this and the prolonged exposure to pollutants is basically um, over and over with a small doses. Uh, it's slowly aggravating our health. Uh, so, um, and we, in the end, we realize that we've been all the time exposed to the pollutants and uh, we only see it when it happens that our health is, we have health problem. And, and a lot, it's very a lot difficult of these, for us to act on it in a sense a lot, without a, a, information. A lot of what you're, what you're discussing here though, would be ones that are directly related to outdoor pollutant levels, the high, high outdoor levels in many but cases. We, yeah, but we have to remember that most of the time we spend indoors and we are exposed to ambient pollution level indoors. Mm -hmm. So even though we, we say, okay, we are separated from um, outdoors by, you know, staying indoors, the buildings are not completely sealed. And those buildings that have ventilation systems, uh, they need to have a proper filtration and proper uh, gas uh, phase filtration as well. And, uh, for the gas phase filtration is not non-existent. So we will be exposed to the pollutants, gaseous pollutants that are outside indoors. And then particles in many buildings, the particle uh, fil filters are uh, of a very poor uh, efficiency, often poorly installed with a lot of leakage on the, uh, uh, in the uh, air handling unit. So that efficiencies are very low, maybe 20, 30 percent, or maybe even lower. So in the end, we will be exposed to those pollutants indoors. Also, when we open the window and so on, so on. So we have to, we have to, for, we, we cannot forget that we are basically immersed on those pollutants also indoors. And on top of that, we will have pollutants that are generated indoors. <clears throat> So, so what are the three different, uh, more of a fundamental question, but can you get the classification of the three different types of air cleaners that are currently available? Yeah, I mean, if you want to characterize air cleaners, you will talk about the uh, air cleaners that remove particles. So that will be uh, particle air cleaners. And then you can have them by... Uh, different ways of uh, uh, removing them. So you can have them mechanically removed or you can use the so-called electronic. So you can um, either use uh, electrostatic filters. So it, basically a charge or the ions uh, to remove them. And then you will have the air cleaners that remove uh, gases and vapors. And so these are gaseous pollutants that are in the air that uh, are removed. And then you will have the air cleaners that are uh, specifically maybe uh, designed for removing the biological contaminants. That could be, you know, viruses, for example. <clears throat> so, so those three different are types. Groups, but yeah. you, in, in between, you have the uh, air cleaners that will be combining the, some of those. So that could be maybe an air cleaner that is combining 
uh, particle removal and biological contaminant removal or particle removal and gas phase removal and so on so on so there will be that will be another class of the uh, uh, air cleaners are you seeing any one of these uh, being more used than others at this point oh, yeah yeah the particle filtration is used everywhere right so that is this is a standard but as i said we, we recently published a paper in uh, this is a what is it this is analysis of the uh, measurements performed in the studies in uh, united states um, in schools in which uh, we measured particle uh, uh, concentration levels and also ventilation uh, in three seasons um, I don't remember the number of uh, classrooms now. And at the same time, we collected information on the absence rates of students uh, in those classrooms. And we show clearly the relation between the particle levels and the absence rate. Of course, with increased particle concentration, <coughs> the uh, absence rates increased. Also, increased ventilation uh, reduced the absence rates. Um, as we have seen in the other studies. But in those classrooms, filtration was used. So there were filters installed. Uh, they were of a low class, MARF-8. And again, this is basically adding to my story, uh, is that if you use the uh, uh, low quality filtration and uh, there will be penetration of pollutants from outside and also because these are American schools, there will be a lot of recirculation. And then, so the pollutants that are particles are generated indoors, they will be also removed to some extent by those uh, filters, but not efficiently. So our, uh, particle air cleaning is, you know, nearly everywhere. Um, we have to also remember that those particle air cleaners, uh, they often installed, or they have been installed, not not always now, but they have been installed also to protect the the technical installations. So against the dust and the larger particles. So uh, you, you can get the uh, clocked uh, heat exchangers and uh, cooling systems and so on, so on. So this is why you why you use those uh, particle air cleaners for the biological contaminants. Probably, I would say. Many hospitals, I don't know how many, but the, in many hospitals, UVGI was used. So this is something that uh, is probably used uh, as well. Uh, the, the least I use the gas phase air cleaners. So any of the, maybe if you think about them, it's probably um, activated carbon filters are used in connection with removal of ozone or something like that. Air cleaners so, are but, used on aircrafts to the large yes. extent, you know, but not in buildings. Bob, you had a question? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess my one question was, Paul, as far as the, the particles uh, in, in those studies, were, how are they being char characterized just by size, like the PM 2.5, or, or were they being characterized by actually what, what, what they were made up of? What were those particles of? No, that, that is a standard procedure. I'm not a, uh, you know, um, expert on that, but that is a standard procedure of testing uh, particle air cleaners. So in that particular area, we are very well uh, prepared to test. Uh, and there are standards and uh, methods of characterizing the performance of the particle air cleaners. So. Uh, and we usually talk about, you know, PM 2.5 and PM 10 here to characterize their performance. <clears throat> and sometimes even the lower particles. Now with the viruses, you know, we were talking about HEPA filters, MARF-13 filters and up. So highly uh, high efficient filters that are able to remove with a high efficiency those very, very tiny aerosols and small particles. You'd mentioned earlier um, that you know, obviously the pandemic drove a lot of the interest perhaps on, on air, you know, portable air cleaners in the indoor environment, um, and, and for better or for worse, right? Because there's some technologies that were probably rushed out to market that maybe weren't that validated. Um, but for the most part, during the pandemic, it was, it was particulate collection, right? They weren't really weren't considering gas phase. So 
classrooms are still underventilated, but you put a HEPA filter in there and you could at least knock some of the particulate load down, right? So, but I, I think there's, unfortunately, I think people, lay people uh, conflate air cleaners. They, they, they think that a portable air cleaner solves all the problems indoors and that's no. not really the case, right? I think there are several names for the air cleaners. And also we talk about air purifiers and so on and so on. Probably air purifiers are more related to the gas phase air cleaning. If you talk about air cleaners and if you go to the uh, supermarket or any other shop that is selling those, uh, usually they will be selling the HEPA. And sometimes they also have a, a carbon uh, filter there. But uh, most of them would have the HEPA filter or maybe highly efficient filter and for removal of particles. So uh, there's a terminology that I've heard used a lot now, um, clean air delivery rate or CADR. Can you mm -hmm. kind of give us a, an update about that and, and how is it used to characterize different air cleaners? Uh, it's a uh, debated uh, terminology, right? A term. Um, I, uh, how to say, clean air delivery rate characterize the performance of the air cleaner. Actually, the air cleaner performance is characterized by three units. It's the efficiency of the air cleaner. And, uh, and you can have a single pass efficiency. So how much pollutant is removed through a, when there is a single pass of the air through the air cleaner. And then there could be an efficiency that is multi-pass uh, efficiency of the air cleaner. And then uh, using the efficiency and the flow through the air cleaner, we can determine the cleaner delivery rate. So the, um, <clears throat> so the air cleaner can have a very high efficiency, but the, if the flow through the air cleaner is very low, then the, uh, the, the additional dilution that is provided by the air cleaner is very low. <clears throat> And the third term that is often forgot, uh, forgotten is so-called effectiveness of the uh, air cleaner. So you always have to compare the uh, cleaner delivery rate. So how much uh, additional dilution is provided for the specific pollutant is provided by the air cleaner. You have to compare it against the other means that are used to ventilate the space. So let's say if your cleaner delivery rate uh, uh, or the, your air cleaner is delivering the dilution that is much lower than or not comparable with the ventilation, ventilation of the space, even through the infiltration, then it has a very low effectiveness. So it does not contribute a lot to the, uh, to the space. Uh, it has for the I think for particular cleaners, uh, the effectiveness is expected to be 80%. So it has to deliver nearly as much as the other uh, means of the removal of particles. There is another problem with the cleaner delivery rate. So unless you have a very well-defined pollutant as it is for the particles, or maybe even virus, if you have aerosol of the certain size, uh, and this is why the particle air cleaners were so popular during the pandemic, is that then you can characterize its performance because you can say, okay, it can remove that type of particle with that efficiency and provides that additional dilution. <clears throat> and it's so effective compared to the other means of removal of particles in the space. <clears throat> However, uh, so that can, that can be done for particles. And, uh, and we have to remember that cleaner delivery rate of the HEPA air cleaner is only in relation to the removal of particles or the removal of dilution of particles uh, in, the, uh, in the air. Whereas uh, for the gas phase air cleaners, uh, it's very difficult to characterize what type of pollutants it will remove. Usually, gas phase air cleaners are tested with one type of pollutant or maybe maximum five or six types of pollutants and uh, those pollutants may not be the pollutants uh, that are relevant for our conditions indoors or for our health or comfort uh, so uh, it's the question of um, 
how to say non-compliance with or maybe not maybe not non-compliance the question about you know what is the relevant uh, what are the relevant pollutants for which we should test the gas phase or cleaners here we don't have standards for that and we don't uh, we have very few standards and very limited you know, and that are not used uh, regularly uh, across different uh, countries and producers so it's very difficult for us to compare the quality and performance of different gas phase or cleaners and that, that was going to be my follow-up question about standards. Uh, from what I understand from your, your um, keynote speech, you, you discussed in some detail about the lack of standard methods to characterize performance of air, of air cleaners. So can you give us a little bit of uh, idea of what that's, uh, why we are having a lack of standard methods? It's mainly about the gas phase air cleaners, perhaps, but uh, for the particular cleaners, I think we are very well equipped here with the standards. Uh, for the gas phase air cleaners, again, what is the standard atmosphere indoors? What pollutants we need to remove and so on and so on. That, that is the ma major challenge for that. There are other challenges. We will be speaking about them in a moment, uh, um, uh, which uh, uh, address the method, method of uh, uh, air cleaning. But uh, that is the challenge uh, for that. And... Uh, mm, I don't know that the standards have not been developed. There are only, I think, two standards uh, uh, for gas phase air cleaners in uh, by Ashra, or maybe maybe three, but very few. So this is uh, this is an issue that uh, really needs to be addressed because you can claim on your performance of the air cleaner, and if you don't have a standard to which you can refer, then it's very difficult to say whether it is or will perform as is promised. Yes, and that, that does bring me back to the one that you mentioned, which is uh, that there are several challenges associated with the use of air, right. air cleaners. Can you kind of describe to us what some of those challenges are? I've mentioned the standard atmosphere, but there are two other important challenges. Is some of the air cleaners during the air cleaning uh, process will produce new pollutants. Um, basically, there will be transformation of pollutants into other pollutants. And in some cases, this transformation may cause uh, that those pollutants that are new pollutants that are generated could be even more hazardous than the pollutants that are you, uh, uh, that, uh, that be, the pollutants prior to the transformation. So. Um, we don't have a methodology or the standard to basically characterize those products uh, of those transformations. So this is one challenge. The second challenge. The third challenge is that many of the air cleaning uh, 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 air cleaners produce ozone. <clears throat> so now there's a lot of debate about ozone. Is ozone really dangerous or it's not dangerous? Or is, it, is, is it an issue or it's not an issue? And uh, I, I think the problem with ozone is that uh, WHO has the ozone um, recommendation of about 50 ppb. Um, and uh, that is the level that uh, uh, when you are exposed to ozone. However, presence of ozone will advance the uh, how to say, possibility of the transformation, chemical transformation of other pollutants. So you may have a much higher level of ozone in the reactor, and that will create the conditions in which the pollutants can be um, transformed into uh, new pollutants, uh, that we don't know what type of pollutants are created. Some of those species are really, could, could be hazardous for us. This is one thing, and then the other thing is that during this process, new reagents will be created that will even participate even or, or exacerbate uh, the, the entire process of transformation into the new pollutants. So um, the ozone uh, may be at the levels that uh, are downstream, the air cleaners uh, itself may not create a hazard, uh, uh, however, presence of ozone in the air cleaner can create a hazard because of those unexpected transformation, the transformation and pro production of uh, new pollutants. 
Well, so this is really... an issue that has to be um, addressed in the standards. And, and these, what makes that probably more challenging, right, is, is there's so many different potential uh, pollutants that can be in the indoor environment. So to try to categorize what you're going to find on point A and point, you know, building, you know, B, uh, yeah, they're sure. going to be they're going to be have perhaps totally different chemical composition. So so that that's a challenge. Right. And one of the other things that, that we see all the time is a lot of the the marketing efforts in some of the companies that manufacture these type of cleaner products. Uh, they're they're so, somewhat confusing, I think, for the lay people. I mean, they you know, they, they claim to just, you know, pure air out the back end of it. All it makes is, you know, carbon dioxide and, you know, um, you know, n nothing bad comes out of these devices, uh, according to the manufacturers. Right. There are papers uh, that clearly show that even relatively neutral pollutants that should not participate in the reaction can be actually transformed into the uh, pollutants that are hazardous. So uh, this is the process that is happening. And uh, we have a documentation that shows that some of those uh, Air cleaners basically produce uh, some um, unwanted pollutants. Uh, we need to be uh, careful and uh, create standards that uh, allow um, to, um, how to say, to characterize the air cleaners to ensure that the, those um, negative effects do not exist. Also, there are air cleaners that do not use other agents. Uh, some this in the position document uh, published on the cleaning filtration on filter air cleaning, and uh, some of it addressed in, in the position document that we are working on, and we hopefully publish it uh, later this year or maybe early next year. So uh, to make it uh, short is. Um, we need to make methods in order to pro to make sure that the air cleaners do not create a risk for us. So on one hand, they may provide a benefit and we no one is objecting that some of the air cleaners will remove the viruses or will kill the viruses or maybe will remove some of the pollutants. But at the same time, this process may create new pollutants and we need, need to assess whether those pollutants that are created uh, they constitute a hazard for the occupants of the buildings. At that time, because we don't have that information, the uh, the principle would be to basically try to avoid the uh, the air cleaners that may create such hazard uh, until uh, the issue is solved. That would be my advice, but it's my personal advice. So we are working yeah, I... on a standard in which. We are now working on a standard in our group or maybe um, the framework for the standard in which we will have a two-stage testing of the air cleaner and the first stage we will be examining whether the air cleaner is not producing those unwanted products so whether air cleaner is truly not aggravating the air quality uh, and then if it if the air cleaner is passing that stage we the air cleaner will be going to the second stage in which there will be a very comprehensive testing of the performance with respect to different pollutants and pollution sources. And uh, this is a standard that you're working on for ASHRAE or another organization? No, I mean, it's um, ISO is uh, no, ISO, okay. probably trying to set up uh, to create a standard. What, we are, I mean, we are developing methodology that can go to the standards. So we are not like, you know, saying that it should be used by ASHRAE or SEN and so on. We try to create a framework, uh, mm -hmm. our methodology that uh, uh, for assessment and rating of the performance of our cleaners that can be then used in the standard. Mm -hmm. And this information does not exist. So, uh, it's it's important to to have that uh, process starting, and I think in the future we will be using more and more our cleaners. You know, our recent I know that maybe I'm digressing a little bit, but our recent work on sleep quality shows that ventilation is very important in uh, in our bedrooms, or the removal of pollutants in bedrooms is very important for the sleep quality. Uh, so think about how many bedrooms do not have 
ventilation in this and in how many bed in how many bedrooms you cannot open window because there is a pollution or noise outside or maybe there is security issue and <clears throat> so we need to develop solutions that will ensure that you will have a high air quality in our bedrooms and probably the air cleaners is one of the potential solutions so and in order to be able to apply it or to use it in our bedrooms we need to better characterize them so this is probably that will create a need to develop the standards and methods for assessing the the performance of our cleaners this is just one of the examples I was wondering, uh, you had mentioned in your keynote that uh, that the information on health benefits is noticeably missing from new and emerging technologies, many of which use special methods to remove and or destroy pollutants. Can you provide more information on this finding in your speech? Yeah, it's, we, we still, you know, it's again, it, it, it is about the toxicity of the pollutants that are uh, generated potentially or removed by the air cleaners. So I, uh, I can say that um, our Belgian colleagues um, um, actually uh, consider a use, using of DALI uh, metric to characterize our cleaners. So they, there is the progress there in which they would like to apply this. So for those who do not know the metric is the DALI, is the disability adjusted life years. It is a standard method for assessing the impact of environmental factor or a certain disease on our life. And it's characterizing the life years lost uh, from uh, our work because of disability and life years lost because uh, of too early, uh, uh, when we die too early. <clears throat> so, um, and this is used by as a standard metric for WHO. So DALI is using uh, WHO is using DALIs to characterize maybe the cardiovascular diseases, car accidents, and so on, so on. So uh, you can refer and compare to this uh, uh, across different you know impacts. And so what they try to do is to uh, they try to develop a methodology in which. You would be able to characterize the performance of our cleaners using that metric and that metric refers to actually health effects because this is the uh, disability adjusted life years so this is the life years lost because of the disability so health disability or because of the premature death so that, this that, is where, where, where oh, this is is a nice development and i think it's generally it's nice it to connect our field to health, uh, mm -hmm. health uh, aspects, just to see this, not only through the eyes of comfort and not through the eyes of the WHO definition of health, which is very wide, but maybe it also to look at the, the, the true effects on health. That's interesting. Uh, you mentioned DALIs. Uh, I've, I've read about them, but I have to admit, I don't know the professor at Belgium that is doing that type of work. Who, who is it that's conducting that uh, right that, now? That, that is uh, Professor Jelle Laverge from Ghent University. Okay, I, I met him. Yeah, yeah. We probably should get him on the show, uh, Bob. He's, yeah, he's, you should uh, get him on the show because uh, he's running also a very interesting project, which is called Annex 86. It is within the, uh, it's an annex within the International Energy Agency which is looking at the smart ventilation and the DALI is used one of the, is, a, is there used as a metric to characterize the uh, per performance of the smart ventilation system. One of the parameters that define smartiness of the ventilation system. Yeah, that, that sounds fascinating. Uh, we're running low on time a little bit, so I have one last question here. Um, you mentioned that in your, your um, uh, presentation keynote that there are basically no regulations concerning the byproducts of pollutants and by cleaners and some air cleaning techniques used and some produce ozone and other highly active reactives during the air cleaning process. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've covered some of that, but I wonder, do you have any thoughts on the lack of regulations? You mentioned there is some regulations for the gas phase. But why, why are we, or no, I'm sorry, more for the particulate uh, type of, of air cleaner. Why are they not for the other types of technologies that are out there? It's, it's hard for me to, to, to say that. 
uh, basically I just want to say that 62.1 actually is uh, referring to some note or some document that is talking about zero PPB ozone. So, you know, or a very low level of ozone is uh, the same is actually in the position document uh, for ASHRA. So, um, so that is um, how to say, um, uh, there is a direction towards, uh, you know, better control of the ozone levels because we better uh, understand the, um, the transformations that could occur because of the presence of ozones, uh, of ozone indoors, and also those transformations that can occur in the air cleaners. Yet, what we really do not understand and we need to understand better is the health effects <laughs> of the byproducts of uh, those reactions. <clears throat> We expect so, them to be, uh, those, many of those pollutants are toxic. Uh, the question is whether they would be uh, uh, occurring at the levels that uh, truly have, uh, have a negative effect on our, on our health. Uh, I, I do not take any position on this. I, I would say that, you know, um, principally, I would uh, rather avoid using that type of systems before, as I said, before we better understand what is going on or before the regulation is coming. And that's the framework you were talking about before, basically, yeah. to come up with a methodology to measure this and, and figure out exactly what, what is taking place. Right. You mentioned 62.1. Uh, their 2022 standard is out. And the next one will be in 2025. Yeah. Um, do you expect that there'll be some changes in regards to these waste uh, byproducts and ozone in the no 2025? Idea. I think it's 62.1 is referring to one document. I don't remember now which one is that, uh, and that is something about zero PPB ozone, but I really don't remember now. I'm, I'm not the specialist at 62.1, so <laughs> we, better have, we better ask the uh, people who, uh, who sit on the committee. Yeah, uh, I do that. Generally, ozone is committee. very much discussed, and ozone is all the time with us, also outside. Mm -hmm. uh, however, outside there is a high dilution also of the ozone products, and ozone presence of ozone is also, you know, not good for us because there is a haze in many places in the world where there is a high traffic. So, you know, um, we know the consequences from the ambient environment. Uh, we know more uh, consequences from the indoor. Uh, I don't want to do anything now and say, well, this is, should not be used or this. I mean, I'm saying what I want to say is we need to be careful and uh, mm -hmm. make the wise decisions here. Uh, so that that that's, is my... That's good. I mean, I think that's what we all should be doing. I, I do sit on 62.1, so I know what you're talking about and, and how it's difficult to make uh, changes in that, but uh, I think it's coming down the pike. Uh, uh, one last question: What What is your thoughts uh, um, in regards to air cleaners in the future? Do you ex you mentioned that you expect that there'll be a lot more use of them? Uh, where do you expect them to be used uh, more frequently? I in public spaces, or in education, many in public spaces. I, I think. Uh, uh if there will be a demand for improved ventilation uh in spaces uh um we will be seeing a need for and if we it will cost energy of course uh, then we will see a need for developing a solutions that uh will reduce the energy use and that that probably air cleaning here can play an important role again without standard methods to characterize those it will be very difficult to deploy them and again uh, i mentioned uh, bedrooms and uh, all the sleeping environments generally because it would be hotel room as well uh, many of those it's very difficult to you know retrofit them with the uh, with the adequate ventilation system it will be too costly and then it will affect the co2 emission and so on so on so here I see the possibility of, uh, you know, of uh, developing some retrofit solutions that maybe including the air cleaners where uh, we can improve the conditions where in uh, which we sleep, uh, not only, you know, the, the bed and bed linen, but also the environment in which we are immersed when we sleep. Great. Uh, Bob, any last questions? 
No, I, I mean, it's it's a topic that's um, I think we're going to hear a lot more about. You know, obviously, the general public is much more tuned into air cleaning than they were uh, three years ago. So, um, yeah, it's uh, I, again, I think it's still there's a lot of emerging technologies that need to get better. And, you know, we'll stay tuned with it. Right. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of emerging technologies and. Again, I want to say we should not, you know, disrespect them or reject them. Uh, but before we, we we really need to develop a standard methodology in which we can use to test and document that their performance is comparable or is better than the systems that uh, are in use today. Uh, be, without this uh, standard methodology, we will not be able to, you know, to First, we will not be able to document this, and further, we would not be able to advance the development of our cleaners because we don't know how they perform now, so how we can advance them. If maybe they are not very good on some aspects that require further advancement. So, you know, we, we need to develop that. It's yes, yeah. and, that, and that's fair, Paul. I think we definitely we need to have a unified standard so we can measure them exactly uniformly. Because you're right; uh, otherwise, we're at the mercy of just marketing uh, claims by different exactly. manufacturers. Right. So we're at well, that I time, aren't you, we? Thank you, Paul, for for thank you, coming thank on you today. Very much for your invitation. And Bob, I hope you want to close this out? Enjoyable for the uh, viewers. Oh, I'm sure it was. I'm sure there's a lot of information that people didn't have before that uh, they did have from this uh, interview. So thank you. Bob, Thanks. you want to bring us uh, to a close? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, we'll uh, we'll be back again in several weeks with another uh, episode of Indoor Environments. Uh, the Indoor Environment Show is a collaboration between the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate, ISIAC, and the in uh, the Indoor Environmental Quality Global Alliance, the IEQGA, um, and it's produced by uh, Healthy Indoors Media. Uh, so, and again, uh, thank you so very much for joining us again, Powell. Um, so yeah. It was a great show, and uh, we will uh, see you uh, all in, on a future episode in the not too distant future.